uh, as I invite up our next panel uh, to talk about some conservative principles to build trust to help uh, confront this big challenge that was outlined by the previous panel, uh, I want to, uh, to direct our attention to the screens and we can watch a couple of statements um, from secretaries of state who are unable to join us together uh, in person today, uh, Idaho Secretary of State Phil McGrain and Kansas Secretary of State Scott Schwab. Hello everyone. I'm Idaho Secretary of State Phil McGrain, yeah. and I just want to thank everyone who is working on building trust in our elections. I think it's one of the most important things we have headed into the 2024 cycle. As someone who was formerly an election official working at the ground, counting ballots, training poll workers, I can tell you we have dedicated people throughout our state and more importantly throughout our entire country who make this happen. In my new role as secretary, I've had the great opportunity to work with so many other secretaries around the country and one of the greatest themes has been how much people appreciate their local election officials whether that's their county clerks their poll workers and if that's something that we share all across our country I think what's important for us as conservatives is to recognize that's true everywhere as a former election official I've been to conferences with peers not just Republicans but also with Democrats and what I've seen is people who are passionate about making our elections work and work well we have a great system in this country, and it's important for all of us to band together to help keep it that way. I hope that we can continue to build trust in our elections across our peer states and across the country. Um, it's one of the most important things that is facing us right now. If people can't trust the elections, how can they trust the leaders who are elected? I, I really am excited about the work of people like this helping identify a conservative agenda, recognizing things like photo ID, paper ballots, not having machines connected to the internet. These are things we can all share in and do everywhere throughout the country. I believe we can be leaders in this space and I appreciate all of you for your work and helping us get there. I'm Kansas Secretary of State Scott Schwab. Nearly a decade ago, the rhetoric around presidential election cycles started changing. Whether it was about voter suppression or foreign interference, accusations were made that so doubt into the American voter about the security and integrity of our election system. About four years later, a presidential election was conducted during a pandemic. This also brought uncertainty, confusion, and a whirlwind of chaos surrounding elections. For far too long, elected officials, activists, and media have told Americans their fundamental right to vote is under attack. We must stop repeating information that isn't factual and operate on the facts. We even saw this commentary at the congressional level when the left introduced a bill that federalized elections during the 117th Congress and called for doing away with the Electoral College. As conservatives, we have an obligation to defend states' rights, to be transparent, and to engage with trusted leaders in our communities to ensure voters of election integrity systems and preserve the institution in which our founding fathers designed to instill in our democratic nation. We must vigorously continue to pursue the strategy to rebuild trust in our elections through strong election laws that have teeth and to champion these strong policy changes across the country. During my tenure as Secretary of State, I have looked for opportunities to make substantive improvements in Kansas' electoral system. In fact, my office led the effort to fix election laws that were outdated and often caused voter confusion. We also added stronger provisions to enhance Kansas election laws, and we did it all without affecting the voter. Americans should feel confident that our elections are conducted with integrity, accuracy, and security. Several policy measures can be enacted across states that help this. Ballot tracking, mail ballot applications, voter ID, and post-election audits. For example, Kansas has had voter ID for over a decade before it became a key feature in election integrity laws across the country. The Kansas State Legislature truly believe that one vote should equal one person, and voter ID is the best method for ensuring that, so our voter turnout actually went up as a result. We cannot be complacent in our election laws. We must champion these conservative laws that states do have and that work towards ensuring election integrity and good outcomes. We must acknowledge that there will be and will continue to be law improvements, but these proposed laws should be substantive and address actual issues rather than perceived ones or based on rumors. Finally, as we prepare for this next presidential election, 
It is important that we move forward as a nation from toxic rhetoric that causes distrust and concern. We find our best assurance through strong election laws and states' rights. Uh, it's, it's really nice to be on this panel, and I want to start by thanking SNF, Agora Institute, and R Street for having the vision to uh, start these conversations and start moving this discussion forward. And I uh, also want to thank uh, Hari Han, Scott Warren, and Matt Germer for inviting us to be here today. Uh, I am Kim Wyman with uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm a senior fellow there, and I am formerly Washington Secretary of State. I do have to uh, admit before we get started, however, that I am at heart an election geek. I know there are some of you in the room, and I say this because there are 363 days, 5 hours, 37 minutes, and 30 seconds between now and the, uh, the close of polls in, uh, in 2024. And I say that uh, to lighten the room a little, because let's face it, the panel that we just heard is a little um, unnerving to hear that that many Americans don't believe in our system as much as they may have a few you know, decades ago. But I think there's a lot of hope. And this, uh, these convenings that you've been hearing about that are culminating with this public uh, sharing today really drive home that there are many people that uh, on the right that believe that we can inspire confidence in our democracy, we can inspire confidence in our elections, and we can get this uh, country back to a place where our elections, which we all believe are the foundation of our uh, democracy, um, to have that confidence. So today, uh, we're going to kind of do a little bit of a dive into uh, these conversations and what's happening across the country in election offices and uh, uh, states across across the U.S. And I have a wonderful panel that I get to moderate today. These are election officials who are really leading the dialogue and standing up and saying that our elections are not only secure and accurate, but that you should have confidence in them. Uh, to my left is uh, Lieutenant Governor from the state of Utah, Deidre Henderson. Uh, I also have David Stafford, who is the Supervisor of Elections in Escambia County, uh, Florida. I almost said California. Okay, sorry. It's been that kind of day. It's after lunch, you know, the blood sugar's dropping, that kind of thing. And then finally, Gabe Sterling, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Georgia Op Office of the Secretary of State. And I imagine that uh, many of you in this room have seen one or all three of them on uh, some coverage in the last four years because they are out in front. So what I wanted to do is kind of take where we, we just left off on this, this loss of confidence and start with what what kinds of things are you uh, facing in your home states or counties that are related to tr the, the trust in the election processes and outcomes? And um, I want to start with you, David. Uh, let's start at the local level. Actually, let me let me strike that. My protocols are really bad here. I would really like to start with you, Lieutenant <laughs> Governor, because that would be the proper order to do this here. Um, could you share what's, what you're seeing in, in Utah? Uh, yeah, you, you know, I, uh, I appreciate being here and I appreciate the good work everybody in this room does. Um, we, in Utah, we're, we're a little bit weird <laughs> in, a, in a good way. Um, we, uh, we have a, a lot of confidence actually in our elections in Utah, but what we will see is a lack of confidence in your state's elections or your state's elections or your state's elections. And that's the problem um, because that actually it fuels the overall mistrust that we, we did see in that, in that Gallup poll. Um, but uh, in Utah, Trump won our state in 2020 by 20 points. It was a huge victory and yet uh, we still experience the same types of challenges, maybe not to, um, uh, not quite to the level that Georgia did, but uh, we still experience those uh, really loud voices who were out there beating the drum saying that our, even our election in Utah was somehow um, inappropriately administered um, and that certain candidates uh, should not, well, okay, for, for my race and governor's race, that, that we somehow should not have won. Um, and, and still these really loud voices trying to drown out all of the, the truth and the good things. So it is a challenge in, in our state. We did enact a very deliberate uh, public 
uh, messaging campaign last year during the 2020 election that I think was very um, helpful and, and that we saw some really good results, even improving our, our levels of trust and confidence in the outcome of the 2022 election. Um, and But even Utah is not, uh, where, where Trump won big, um, is, is not uh, immune to these challenges um, and, and that lack of, of confidence overall in our election system, which is so scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So David, what, what are you seeing in, in Florida? Um, well, thank you, thank you for having me um, here. Like, not unlike uh, other states, other jurisdictions, we, we do, uh, we've seen, particularly since uh, 2020, and, and, and like Utah, I don't think the margins were, I, I know the margins were not as big as, as Utah, but um, former president did win in 2020, and, and if you've obviously, Florida being the epicenter of election reform uh, since the infamous 2000 election, uh, so we've started to see some of that, you know, creep in. Uh, interestingly, I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Stewart uh, being on the panel because he helped us. We did actually a voter intercept, a very robust voter intercept survey in 2016. So it just kind of gives you an idea. Now, I don't have the, the post-2020 numbers, but just to kind of give you an idea of where we were. And when I say robust, we had almost 1,400 respondents to this survey, it was, and it was on election day and then even some post-election day. And, and the question was asked, uh, the intent, the, how confident are you that your vote was counted as intended? Um, again, 20, 2016 presidential election, and those who, it was a four-point scale, one and two are negative, three and four are positive, 93% uh, said uh, very or somewhat confident. And that's, that was, there wasn't a huge difference between uh, the political parties uh, on those. And then if you look at, to your point, uh, if you were, drill down a little bit and said, what about, okay, the local level, uh, and again on this one to four point scale, uh, at that time it was 3.6% um, ranking. State, rest of Florida, 3.4. Then you move away to national, 3.1. No idea what those numbers would look like uh, today. Uh, but I, I can't imagine that they would be anywhere near uh, what they are there, what they were then. Uh, so we, we, we've seen that and, uh, in, in our um, county, our county, just to kind of give you an idea, it's 46 percent registered Republicans, 31 percent registered Democrat, Democrats, and then the balance are either no party affiliation or third party. Um, and e even so, our counties and a lot of the other, what you would term red counties in the state have, have seen uh, this lack of confidence and, you know, cr across the spectrum accusations that things were done uh, either purposefully or negligently to allow um, you know, votes that shouldn't be cast. Uh, there's, there's talk about, uh, we're seeing this movement towards hand counted paper ballots. Um, so we're, we're, we're dealing with it uh, in, in our state, um, but our state, you know, again, as, as we're used to it, if you will, um, for the last 20 years, we've been dealing with the, the repercussions of, of 2000. So we've been the butt of jokes, um, and we've been the ones that people say, well, at least we're not Florida. And now I think we've, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of the system that we have in place now and the reforms that we've made over the years, and they continue to, uh, the legislature uh, continues to make some, some tweaks, some, some of which are lo local election administrators work with the uh, legislature and the, and the administration on some of them, we have some dialogue back and forth, but ultimately we're, we're left with uh, implementing some of these uh, reforms. So we, we continue to, and this whole idea of, pro, of continuous improvement. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. We're kind of focusing on getting the job done uh, and then going out and talking to anybody who's willing to listen to us about the, the things that we do, the audits, um, the photo ID, et cetera. All right, and we saved Georgia for last. So Gabe, what are you seeing? I would love to have the problems y'all have with these wide margins. It would be great. Um, and we used to have that, obviously. 2020 was unexpected to a degree. In fact, when we were preparing for it, 
we were kind of looking at what happened in 2018, where we were being vilified from the left. And Stacey Abrams not accepting the outcome of the election, voter suppression. One of my favorite ones was that Brian Kemp was driving around with power cords from Gwinnett County trying to suppress voters. I mean, we were just dealing with that constantly all the time. So we're like, okay, we really got to make sure that we let make sure that the Democrats and the people on the left understand it isn't a stolen election. We have, we have you know, automatic voter registration, which we've had since 2016, online voter registration. In fact, we were at 98% eligible registered in 2020. I mean, that was the level we had already. So everybody who wanted to but had the opportunity to vote. And then I remember we also had one other thing we changed. From 2018 to 20, into 2020, we implemented a new voting system that had a paper ballot for the first time in 20 years in Georgia. And I thank God every day because I can't imagine what would have happened if we had 11,779 votes on DREs. And a recount is this. Press a button. It's the same. So we were able to do the 5 million hand tally and showed we were off by 0.1053% and the total votes cast of 0.0099% for the margins. So having those were great. Now, the reality of stuff we're dealing with still, having those tools and having that ability really helped out a lot. And having very engaged, very good county offices. And that's the one thing I want to say. I've gotten to go around the country. County offices and local jurisdictions work their tails off. They are almost uniformly underfunded. They get attacks. They get death threats. They get all the, the crap rolling downhill hits them. I mean, even in counties where Trump won by 30 points, this is all your fault. And it's terrible. Now, we saw it sort of calm down through 2022 with the passage of the Election Integrity Act in Georgia. We put some more guardrails in around absentee balloting. We moved to a binary system for identification of voters using the driver's license, of which we have 98%. We have 99.9% of the last four Social Security numbers, so we can identify voters in our list. And we didn't call it continuous improvement. I'm going to start stealing that from you, Lieutenant Governor. We've been investing and doing stuff as we have. We have added to our ballot tracking. We're working with USPS to do the full all the way through. It's now at this the Crown Road facility. Now it's in the truck, and now it's going to be in you know all the informed delivery. We're working on that. We launched a brand new voter registration system. We built in 19 months. We had the very first test of it yesterday in 122 counties with a nearly 400,000 people voting overall in our municipals. This is about 7%, which is too low for locals. I never understood that either. People will go vote for the God King president in huge numbers, but you know your roads, your police, your fire, your schools. Your your, you know, all your water, sewer, all that stuff is in that local election, but you leave it to these 7% of people who show up. But we were happy to have it there. It all worked. And one of the things that we're doing to prepare for these things is, and we talked about this before, flooding the zone with information. Right before this, I did two television interviews, explained to people we had one of the most secure voter registration systems. It's on the FedRAMP cloud. It worked beautifully. You know, we had a couple of hiccups where some cities were doing redistricting. It's human error. Last night, we saw Pennsylvania, another human error in programming ballots. And because I'm a masochist, I went on Twitter and started explaining it to people, which was still the right thing to do. Because one of the things you talked about, Lieutenant Governor, is I don't know about your state. I do know about other states. Every state has very similar processes. They might be different. There's different ways to do it. But almost all of them have paper ballots. Almost all of them have you know, a way to identify the voter. We limit those voters to one vote. They have you know, audits. They have reconciliations. We have all these processes, and nearly every state does it. The some thing, states do crazy things like California leaving the certification open for a month? Sure. Is that a terrible idea for conservatives? Yes. But I also know that those local county elections officials aren't cheating, because it's really hard. And we've got to be prepared to say that over and over again, that other states are doing it differently than us, but they're not cheating. Thank you. And I, I want to go back to your beginning remarks, because I, I think it's important to point out, I. I got to live through the closest governor's race in the country's history in 2004 in Washington State as a local election official. And the thing that I remember most about that, and I remember a lot about it, um, because it was, uh, at the end, it was 133 votes separating 2.7 million casts after two statewide recounts and a, a six-month-long court case. And what I remember about all of the litigation and all of the allegations, as long as your team was ahead, you thought the elections were awesome. <laughs> and the next day when you weren't, suddenly it was fraught with fraud or suppression or whatever the arguments were. And I, I think we need to not lose sight of that. Because right now, as we sit here today, we've got a lot of people stuck on 2020 and they keep reflecting back and they tend to be, you know, Trump supporters. But make no mistake, 
This can come on either side from either side with the same vitriol and hopefully not the same reactions. But um, I think that we, we just have to keep our guard up. And, and I'd like to go back to you, David. Um, what things are you doing in Florida in Escambia County that are uh, kind of trying to preempt uh, 24 and, and get prepared for it? Well, I mean, I think from local election officials, what, uh, you know, we've, we, as you know, uh, having served as one, the minute you wrap up one election, you start preparing for the next one. So, you know, part of it, in particular, you know, you're once every four years, uh, you've got the presidential election. And in Florida, that means an extra election. We have the, what's called the presidential preference primary, which happens in uh, March. So that backs up the timeline. So we, we've really been, again, you know, preparing for, for this election cycle. Um, so, you, you know, you're, you're looking at how, how you can do things better. Um, and there's unique things uh, that, that come with presidential election cycles that you don't see. Mostly, you know, you think about turnout, so everything's elevated, you know, um, your, uh, the amount of ballot envelopes and, and you know, supplies that you, and, and that you have to acquire, but also the personnel. You just need more people to do the work because you have more turnout. Uh, and then, of course, you're dealing with the, the, the policy changes, the legislature, of course, that they came in in, in 20, early 2023 and, uh, and made some, some tweaks. Uh, so we're dealing with that, you know, and then the, the result of that rulemaking and, and, and all of that fun stuff, and then preparing for another legislative session that's going to happen in early 2024. Um, and then just doing the, the business of, uh, of, of running your office, um, doing the list, you know, the, the list maintenance procedures. Um, and then when you have opportunities to go out and talk to people, you know, whether it's Rotary Clubs or, um, you know, civ other civic groups, the political parties, uh, third party groups. Um, you know, if I get invited, I go. And, and all you can do is continue to tell your story. You know, again, in Florida, a lot of these, these, these principles, I think, that are going to be uh, unveiled here are a lot of things that we've been doing. Uh, in Florida for, for quite some time now. So we're, we're comfortable with the, the, the system uh, that we have and again, continue to, to make changes. So it's, it's just, you know, getting your message out, making sure that, that people at least have an understanding. It doesn't mean they necessarily have to accept it, but have an understanding of how you do things and some of the procedures uh, that we have in place. Uh, everything from, uh, from audits to, you know, the, the fact that 100% of our vote by mail ballots are uh, are verified. Um, people, you know, still question that, but it, it's it's a true thing. You can come in and see 40, 50,000 uh, ballots that are that are verified. Um, so it's again just just doing your job uh, mm -hmm. is the is the the, the basis, and then um, getting out and, and and telling people what what it is that you're doing. Um, and then you know, if they, hopefully, then that builds confidence. And, and particularly, the other thing that I think that, at least speaking again for my own state. Um, that we're, we're a diverse group. You know, we've got counties at 1.4 million like uh, registered voters like Miami-Dade down to Lafayette County, don't call it Lafayette, Lafayette County, uh, with about 4,000 registered voters. And so, um, very diverse group, politically, ideolo ideologically, as far as the counties and their, and their electorate. But we work together uh, as a cohesive group. Um, you know, I, there's several of my colleagues, I couldn't even tell you what their party affiliation is. Uh, because we all have the, a shared mission and, and the thing that I think you can probably speak to, everybody on this stage can, can speak to, is that election officials are some of the most collaborative uh, bunch of people that you'll ever find. Uh, they're willing to help because they, we understand that we, we, we all succeed and fail together. So uh, part of it is also uh, working with other election officials, like personal improvement, you know, how, how can I do my job better? How can my team do our, our job better? And I think that's the, that's the basis of you know, what we continually try to do. And Lieutenant Governor, as a, a former official who helped, you know, m migrate from poll site voting to all male voting, I, you know, Utah kindred spirit here. Um, tell me what, what you're doing in Utah and what you're seeing in your counties and what you're doing at the state level to prepare for 24. Well, the, I think the biggest thing that we're doing to prepare for 2024 is to make sure that we uh, 
build trust among the public, and we do that by being good at what we're doing, right? Understanding the law, making sure that um, our, our clerks and our election workers are adequately trained, uh, making sure that the public is informed, as well informed as we can and help them be. It's, it's a lot of hard work, and sometimes it, it feels like the starfish, starfish principle, you know, you've got all the starfish on the beach, and you maybe throw one or two in the water, but you're saving them. You can't save them all, you can save a few. Um, the previous panel talked about uh, you know, these different kind of buckets of, of, of voters, uh, the different um, you know, Trump conservatives, Biden conservatives, liberal voters. Who, who is our target audience? And in the state of Utah, we've recognized really that there are some people whose minds we are never going to change. And we have to just come to terms with that. We don't waste a lot of time or effort on the, on the loud, unfortunately very loud sometimes, uh, voters who, who are going to believe what they believe and are going to say what they're going to say and no matter of, you know, no amount of facts or, or truth or reason or logic is going to change their minds. So we, we just disregard them and we hope that we can get the persuadable middle. Um, we hope that we can stave off some of the folks who might go to you know, Thanksgiving dinner with their uncle and hear something and then be persuaded by that. Uh, we hope to become that authoritative voice and source and recognizing that proximity is important to gaining trust. Um, we've really mobilized our, our local officials. Um, we had a, a big ad campaign last year and it wasn't just TV ads or radio ads. It was, it was a, a, a big effort um, to help people understand that, that those who are running the elections are their neighbors. These are the people that you go to school with. These are the people that you uh, meet at the grocery store, that are in your church, um, that, that are your neighbors, your friends. These, these are who run our elections, not some faceless, nameless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. Um, it, it's it's your, the people in your community are the ones that run your elections. And if you trust the local elections, which most people do, um, those are the same elections where your federal officials were elected. That's the same election where your president was uh, elected, uh, where your, your governor was elected. Um, and so helping people identify that um, has been, we have found to be very helpful. Also being very transparent about our election processes, and they're complicated. I, I, was a, I became lieutenant governor in January of 2021. Before that, I spent eight years in the Utah State Senate terrorizing, I'm sure, the executive branch. Now that I'm in the executive branch, I understand a little bit better. Um, I, I didn't mean to. Uh, I didn't know what I, was, what I was doing to people. But, but working on policy, which is what the legislature does, right? And now we, we have to implement it. But even legislators, even I, still don't fully understand what the people who have been running elections for so many years actually understand. Um, and so educating people is hard, it's hard work. But making sure that you're educating the right people who can help um, counter some of the, the noise out there has been really important for us. Um, also making sure that the public understands that they can go to their county clerk and they can get a tour of the voting center. They can understand what the process is. Everything that the counties do in terms of elections, or the logic and accuracy tests, the audits, the counting of the ballots, uh, all of those things are done in, in publicly noticed meetings. If the public can go and watch. And we've invited people to go. Hardly anybody ever does. Um, but we did find last year that those who did go, some of the most, uh, uh, the, some of the loudest voices who had the most distrust in our process left, actually some of them signing up to be poll workers uh, because they, they thought, okay, I, I get this, I understand the process now and I, and I believe in it. Um, we had a, a local radio host who was uh, saying uh, false things on the radio. I don't, it wasn't malicious, it was just out of lack of understanding. So I called him up and I invited him to go on a tour of an election center with me, which he did. It, it's that sort of hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, for lack of a better term, that is really effective in, in countering some of the loud voices. It's, it's not, uh, it, not going to get everybody, but it's, that sustained effort is part of the durability question. It, it is very needed um, to, to make sure that we're continuing to build trust, and it, and it happens over time, um, and, uh, and it's and it's worth doing because there's nothing more important 
than these assets of our, our democracy, protecting them and making sure that uh, people who vote, it's only eligible people who vote and that they have the confidence that their vote's going to be counted and counted accurately. Absolutely. and and. I found myself after hearing all the data, which I've already seen, but hearing it out loud just was a little, gave me a little PTS. Um, but, but these are the things that are actually making me feel better about this and this work that, um, you know, thank you, Scott and, and Matt for, and Jonathan, where you are, um, for, for having this vision because this is exactly what we're trying to tap into. The, the local election officials are the most trusted sources of information, second only to the state election officials in, the, in a voter state. And so kind of playing off of that, I think there is hope and I think we can rebuild that trust, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, David can tell you probably 20 years to re rebuild the confidence ish yeah, we're still working on it. I know and Washington <laughs> too so I, I get it well now let me take a minute to share with you and this is sort of our public unveiling of the conservative principles that uh, came out of all of these convenings that have happened over the last year or so and uh, these are really principles to build on and build these messages of uh, how we conduct elections in this country and why you as a, a voter as an American should have confidence in them um, so there are three main principles that um, I'll talk a little bit about in, in detail, but the first one is publicly affirming the security and integrity of elections across the United States and avoid actively fueling doubt in other, about elections in other jurisdictions. The second principle is use transparency and public outreach to reassure voters of election integrity. And then finally, champion policy changes that can help build trust in the spirit of continuous improvement of our electoral system. And each of you, if you haven't already noticed, there is a, uh, a nice summary of all of these that you're, you're welcome to follow along right now, or you can take with you and, and read later. But in talking, in talking through these during the convenings, um, th there's a lot of, a lot of different points of view, even in a room full of conservative uh, election officials and, and academics and, and others. Um, but this first one, publicly affirming the security and the integrity of the system, I think is really crucial. And it operates on a, a, a couple of levels. The first one I think you've heard here with the three panelists of, of talking about those security measures that are happening in, in you know, my local county and my state, uh, from pre-election audits, LNA tests, to um, the use of paper ballots and the storage and security of those, those um, ballots, and making sure that you're auditing those, those results every step of the way through the process through certification and explaining to the public what those steps are because I think most people have no idea what a logic and accuracy test is until they see it. Um, but, but starting there and, and building that trust by sharing those, those practices and then, then taking that next step and saying this is how we do it here in my county in my state. And when you have the naysayer who says, yeah, I, I know you're doing a great job, Kim. Gabe, you're awesome. Yeah, David, I get it. But it's those other people. It's in that one state. And I heard that, I can tell you, when I was, you know, especially after the, the governor's race, heard that all the time. Yeah, Kim Thurston's fine, but it's King County. Phew, they're, they're a mess. And that's the moment, and this is what we really hope election officials and, and the people that will hopefully subscribe to these and use these principles and apply them will think about that moment of choice. Yes, this is how we do it here in our state. And in fact, I don't know all of the laws in the state that you're alleging has problems. But what I can tell you is their state legislature has made the laws. They're different than ours, but the same basic principles are in place. The security measures, the control measures to make sure that, that the election is being conducted with integrity and that they, they certify their election and that their voters can see the process from start to finish. Those simple basic things that most Americans, quite frankly, have no idea happen in each state are important to reinforce and that's one of the things we're really hoping. And then also just being transparent about uh, those minor things that go wrong in an election. Um, and you know, I've, I've done this work for a long time and I know everybody on this panel has as well. Uh, what you find is that you have humans involved in the process and when you have humans involved in any process, there are gonna be mistakes. Now, you have to differentiate from those mistakes that happen because you have a complex system from widespread fraud. 
and the intention of overturning an election. Because those are two very different things. And I think that's one of the things that is going to be a very important focus going into 24, because that's what's going to happen. We saw it a little bit yesterday, and I'm glad you were on Twitter trying to, to right the wrong. Mistakes are going to happen. People are going to put the wrong paper into a, a printer at the polling place. And it's going to cause lines because it's not working. That doesn't mean that it was fraud. It doesn't mean it was voter suppression. And that's the type of conversations that need to happen in communities throughout the country. Uh, the second area is using transparency and public outreach to reassure voters. Um, dovetails into what I was just saying. Invite people in to see how, how the election is conducted. How do you process an absentee or mail-in ballot? How are the checks and balances in the uh, polling places or vote centers in place with a Democrat and a Republican representative and those checks and balances that, that election officials, quite frankly, take for granted? And poll workers might as well. The public may not know it. And then I, I was really happy to hear um, the, the examples that were in the uh, remarks already. Share those with the trusted voices in those local communities. Go to the faith-based um, leaders in the community, the business leaders, apparently firefighters, now we know that to add that to the list. Um, those, those community leaders and groups that are, are out reaching people, they're probably the most powerful influencers that we have. And I realize it's hard to go you know, through the whatever, how many thousands of, of counties do we have across the country and municipalities that do elections, somewhere between 8,800 and 10,000, depending on who you talk to. Um, but we have to start there, because that's where the people trust the, the information. And then finally, championing policies that really do um, help build trust in the system and, and have that that spirit of continuous improvement. And, and the lieutenant governor was the one who kind of shared that in an earlier meeting. And I love that because every election is a learning opportunity to improve the next. And sometimes you get to do that on the front page of the local paper or on the you know, 5 o'clock news. But um, it's, it's always constant improvement. And one of the things that I'm, I really love that has come out of these convenings is some of the ideas and these policy recommendations. The first one, pre-processing um, ballots. And coming from a, a vote by mail state and having elections where we were sitting on hundreds of thousands of ballots that we received election day, it was imperative to have that time to process as many as we could before 8 o'clock when the polls closed so we could release the results quickly after the closing of the polls and you didn't have that time gap where people will fill the void. And if you have if you have a large amount of ballots that are uncounted, I guarantee you every day that clicks by, it's more time for the, the naysayers to fill the void and tell you what's happening, tell the public what's happening. Ballot tracking, uh, this is a practice where a voter can, can check their absentee or mail-in ballot from the time they put it into the drop box or mailbox to the time it's ready and approved for counting. And states are doing this. Uh, many states already have it in place. Uh, voters typically aren't going to look at that too much unless something gets really close or tight, like every election. But this is just one more way to inspire confidence. Uh, voter ID, and I know that this has certainly become a political football, and there are many, uh, many accusations of suppression in where it's involved. And I think this is one where conservatives need to continue to double down on. Uh, my state in Washington has had voter ID since 2005. And we rolled it out, and it was with very little controversy. And that was a, a blue-leaning state at the time, and still is. Um, and it hasn't suppressed voters, and it has been empowering because it inspires confidence. And I think um, we're seeing that in states. And I think the Georgia experience is a really good example of what we're seeing is that it's not suppressing voters. And it's a narrative. It's a political narrative that we can counter with the actual results. Uh, Pre-certification audits, uh, I think many of you, I hope all of you in this, in this room know that election night at the close of polls and when results come out is not the end of the election. It is for the media often and it is for many voters, but in the world of elections that could be another week or two or as much as, as almost a month. And I know, who was it that was just saying that drives them crazy, um, that, that people hate that long window. But in states, uh, particularly on the West Coast, they have long, uh, long certification windows for a reason, to make sure that they get everything right. Make sure that every eligible ballot is cast and all of the ineligible ballots are reviewed thoroughly before they're rejected. And these are important steps. And so again, differences in states 
have to be respected because there's a reason their legislatures um, put those into place. And so having audits during that window of certification is just another way to continue to inspire confidence to show that the electronic results that we have produced over the last you know, two weeks match the physical paper ballots that, that um, spit those results out. And finally, paper ballots. Um, I'm a big advocate. Uh, I know that the uh, states have been moving towards, uh, moving towards paper ballots as their standard and having them be marked by a, a voter is good too. And please don't confuse that with hand counting those paper ballots because other than recounts and audits, I would not advocate that practice. But paper ballots are a way to physically go back and have something to argue about. And if it's all electronic, the challenge then becomes you have to look through millions of lines of code to prove that there was no code in there that threw the election. So anyway. Okay, so with those principles in mind, um, next what I'd like to do is kind of talk about the principles from your perspectives here. Um, what do you, let's start with you, Gabe. What do you think about the principles? And We already do all this stuff, so we're fine, I'm fine with them. Okay. I mean, <laughs> the, the thing about all, they're all, this is about conservative principles. Every single one of these is ridiculously common sense. <laughs> if you argue against it, you're arguing against the common sense of the average American who thinks, I've got my ID to do everything else I gotta do, maybe I should do it to vote. They should do pre-certification audits to make sure the machine's counted. You know, we should do ballot tracking. All these things are extremely common sense, and the good part about them is I think we can have generalized agreement on how to do these things. Should we have more audits? I think we should always have more audits. And you should never have a law that prevents your, your local jurisdictions from doing more audits if they so choose to enhance the confidence there. We have one guy in our state, in Bartow County, that he audits nearly every single race. He invites people in. We can't all be, you know, Haydar Garcia and, and be able to talk every election denier through every single process. But some other things that we're doing on the transparency side, we've launched a data hub. One of the things we learned in 2020 was, so we can make a claim, they dropped hundreds of thousands of ballots in at midnight. And we're like, no, these were the same, you know, 1.3 million advanced ballots you knew on Friday were there, guys, nothing changed, but they came in at a different time. So now we, we have the, a data hub that you can go to as a voter and see, on Tuesday, there were this many um, absentee in person, which is early voting. There were this many ballots accepted. There were this many ballots that were rejected. There were this many ballots that were cured. I mean, you can see the entire process on a single page. You can go county by county, district by district, and you can see all of it. We spend a lot of money on that, and it's getting a lot of good coverage, and we talk about it all the time. So transparency is important. Our counties do a good job. These all make easily common sense. And if you're in a policy situation, you can really put the, your, your legislators on the other side in a corner. I mean, they love to talk about voter ID as a voter suppression method. Every study has showed that's not true. Um, we've had record, vote, record turnout in Georgia at the presidential in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. We had record turnout in 2020, 2022 for a midterm after we passed the Election Integrity Act. Our systems work. You can get registered easily, you can vote easily, it's really hard to cheat. If you follow these principles, that can enhance people's belief in this. We did, a, 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 a UGA did a poll with MIT, and 90% of the people in Georgia thought that the election was pretty well run in 2022. Now the problem is, it goes back to what we talked about before. I think a large reason that some of that swung was Republicans won everything. So, other than Herschel Walker, who lost in the Senate race, but I mean, Brad was elected with the biggest margin of anybody in the state. Kemp crushed it. I mean, Stacey Abrams coming back for her thing. She was beaten by over 300,000 votes. She actually conceded this time. Um, so that was a good step forward for us. And one of the other things that we did tactically um, in the primaries in 2022 was there's three different races that were very, very, very close. 42 votes away from having to go to a recount, those kind of things. Those candidates, Democrat and Republican alike, could have made a stink. They could have stamped their feet up and down. They could have gone to court. In all likelihood, they would lose. And we had people that they trusted, and, and some of us in the office reached out to them saying, yes, you have every right to go to court. But to make Georgia better, elections better, and America better, graciously take the loss and move on to the next thing. And there's a certain irony with that. If Donald Trump had graciously taken the loss and moved on, he'd probably be waltzing into the White House right now. So there's a lesson in that for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor, how would you make a difference, or how do you think it would make a difference if these messages and policies were widely adopted? Well, I, I think, as Gabe said, they're, they're probably widely adopted in some ways. Um, what I want to talk about is that number one, that, that first one, publicly affirm 
the validity of elections in other jurisdictions and other states. This is something I think, maybe not all of us are guilty of this, I know that I am, not understanding how uh, harmful it is to say, well, we're doing things great in Utah. I don't know how they do it in Wisconsin, but in Utah, we're, we're good. Um, that's harmful. Mm -hmm. and, and pointing this out, that it's, it's damaging to the overall system, it's damaging to overall trust in elections, it's contributing to the problem that we're all here trying to solve, is really important to point out. So I love that first principle uh, and I, I will actively try to do better myself, understanding that we should not be propping ourselves up by tearing other people down. And even when we don't think that we're actually tearing them down, we are. We're not just tearing down Wisconsin, we're tearing down the whole system by actively undermining other people's, by saying maybe we don't understand how they do it, but we're good. So I, I think that public affirmation is super important. Mm -hmm. um, we have in Utah 29 county clerks. 20 of those 29 county clerks are new since 2020. Nine of them have never run an election before this year. We're in the middle of municipal election and you all had a, a, an election day yesterday. We have ours to look forward to in two weeks uh, because we have a special congressional election so we had to move ours so we'll be We'll be voting and processing ballots and all of those things the week of Thanksgiving, so yay Utah. <laughs> uh, but but you know, we have a challenge keeping elected officials, local elected officials in office because it's a crappy job right now, if we're being totally honest. Um, the, the threats, the, the, the number of changes that, that are coming down, the accusations, it's one thing to suggest that someone could do something better. It's another thing to impugn their integrity, their character, accuse them of cheating, accuse them of nefarious things that don't happen, and it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of turnover. Uh, we've had a challenge getting recruiting people uh, to, to want to come in and, and be poll workers, and it, it, there are just big challenges that come when people distrust the system. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to do better, we've got to build that public trust. And, I, and these principles in all will help build that public trust, but I think this number one is really key to making sure that we're not tearing other people down. Instead, we're, we're affirming and building everybody up. Absolutely, and I'll just add to it that this is the heart of the, the challenge, because in that moment it's so easy to say, yeah, I know, can you believe them? And that. We've been talking about that influence of state and local election officials being the trusted sources. When it, I was auditor, when I was secretary, if I said those things, it actually was undermining my voters' confidence in my elections. And I think the more we can start sharing this and getting our colleagues to, to buy into it, I think the better uh, we're going to be off as a, as a country. Um, David, you're going to get the last question. Um, how can we promote these principles most effectively, especially in the lead up to 24? Well, I mean, I think events like this are, are, are helpful. The, the one, a couple of uh, just reflections on this. Um, you know, I think that, that realistically, so having these principles, I think, is, 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 a, is, a, is a wonderful, wonderful and laudable goal. We always need to, to re remember that in the United States, uh, elections are run at the state and local level. And so you are necessarily going to have state by state, even sometimes county by county and jurisdiction by jurisdiction, jurisdiction differences uh, in how um, elections are conducted. Utah, you guys are, you may, you're almost 100% vote, uh, vote by mail, right? And that's a, that's a red state. Uh, other states, particularly in the Southeast, uh, up until 2020 did very, very little uh, vote by mail. So making value judgments on things like that, yeah, I think you want to shy away from. Uh, one of the things that, uh, as far as the principles are concerned, one of the things that, that uh, Florida deliberately has done, uh, and again, I'm, I'm talking about the policymakers over the years, particularly since 2020, I mean, excuse me, since 2000, is it made a conscious decision to focus on the pre-processing uh, of ballots. And I, I told this story yesterday, but uh, we actually have a state law um, that within the 30, first 30 minutes after the polls close, uh, we have to report 
it, all of our vote by mail ballots, otherwise known as absentee in other places, that we've, uh, that we've processed uh, to date, as well as 100% of our early in-person votes, which generally averages about two-thirds of the votes that are cast in any given election. Within the first 30 minutes, we're by law mandated to report that. Um, and so I call it feeding the beast. You know, people are, are hungry for those initial results. And these aren't just, these aren't exit polls. These are actual uh, results uh, that come in. And then we get uh, our uh, election day results uh, come in pretty rapidly after that. So by the end of election night, you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning in a big election, upwards of 95% uh, of the votes that are cast in that election, uh, the initial uh, results are, are, are transparency, transparently uh, shared uh, to our voters and, and, and the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Yeah, I know, because I hear from my voters all the time complaining <laughs> yeah. about us because of you, because of how well you do. <laughs> but, but again, th those, are, those are deliberate policy decisions that are made because they're, they're, they're trade-offs. There's things, you know, that, that you, you could, there's value. Let's say you, you give voters an extra couple of days to cure a vote-by-mail ballot, a laudable goal. How long do you uh, allow that to happen, you know? So well, let's make it a week. Well, you know, ours is two days. Uh, is that enough? You know, we've found, you know, I think our policymakers said, said that it is. And so these are some of the, some of the decisions, some of the, 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 the considerations that go when you're start, starting to talk about uh, making policy changes. Some things that sound good also have other effects. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I just want to stress that's one of the things that, uh, good, good, bad, or indifferent, that Florida has done uh, over, the, over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, but, again, getting back to number one, I, you know, it, it is, it's, I, I used the term again yesterday, Day is pretty much if you're in elections long enough, you're going to have your, your your time in the barrel. Okay, so just like in life, I'm sure your parents have told you you, you don't want to build yourself up by tearing somebody else down. Uh, and I think that certainly can uh, it, it goes to it, it's a um, laudable goal, goal for, for for election administration because you know there but the but for the grace of God go I. Um, you know, if you're, you're in this business long enough, you're going to have uh, an issue just because that's the nature uh, of elections. You do what you can to try to minimize that. So don't ever celebrate. You know, I tell, we, we, we have kind of a code among our, at least within our state, of, you know, don't, and you, using the common lexicon, don't, don't throw somebody else under the bus. Again, because you may be the one that's, that's getting backed over uh, next week or next month. So I think that's an important well yeah. Uh, concept. Well, luckily, elected officials rarely are disparaging to other people, so it shouldn't be a problem. There. <laughs> okay. But the Come other, on. The, the, the other Come thing, on, you guys. The, the last on. thing I'll say about that is also, um, you know, don't talk about what you don't, yeah. you're not sure about. Yeah. You know, you hear you hear things about how things are done in, in a particular state uh, or a particular jurisdiction or something that happened over there. Uh, because, you know, you get out of your skis on, on something like that and you're, you're going to have to walk yourself back or, um, you know, particularly if you don't under, completely understand it. So, there, again, it's, I guess my point is, uh, and I'll you know, land the plane here, is it's, it's, it's nuanced, right? It doesn't mean you have to go out and, you know, defend every, uh, everything that's, that's done in all 10,000 jurisdictions, uh, but there is the ability to, to sort of refrain from piling on or talking about something you, you really um, don't have the ability to, to fully understand. We can't be part of the weaponization of human frailty. Yes. That's, that's the real issue here, and that happens a lot in this particular space, unfortunately. Um, people are going to make mistakes, and you've got to give grace on those, but the good part about it is, is nearly every single state and every jurisdiction has the reason we know about the mistakes is because we caught the mistakes and we corrected the mistakes. Right. I mean, that's the reality of it. So you right. get the final ca vote count proper. Everybody's supposed to vote votes. Everybody is a legal voter, and they vote one time. Those are the principles of it, and that's the right. final say on it. Right. Okay, we've got about five minutes uh, before the next break. Does anyone have any questions? Seriously? Come on, guys. <laughs> Man. <clears throat> Yay, we have a question. We do? Okay. We apparently have 10 minutes. If you want to make the perfect brisket, this is how you start. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Stefan with the Horizons Project. Thanks so much for a really excellent panel. Um, my question is, we were reflecting uh, together yesterday on the principles, um, on the three principles. And the one um, that we were talking about that may perhaps have been de-emphasized or omitted was just um, 
the notion of rejecting political violence and threats of political violence as a key principle to instill trust in elections. And I wonder, because over the course of the past day and a half, we've heard so many examples of how people are suffering from the threats, the harassment, the actual use of political violence. And I just wonder how you all are reflecting on the role of officials and non-officials in categorically denouncing political violence and threats thereof. Thanks. Who wants to start? Oh, no, I, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I, I appreciate the question, Maria. It, um, it's something that has come as a shock to me as an elected official. I was served for eight years in the Utah Senate with, you know, nobody knew who I was and nobody cared. And, um, and now still nobody knows who I am and a few people care. Um, <laughs> that's about it. And, but that rhetoric, the, the violence, the threats, it is real and it's, mm -hmm. and it's scary, it's unsettling. Um, I mentioned how we have su had such a high turnover in our county clerks and, and it, part of the problem is uh, figuring out how to deal with that emotionally even. And so as a, as a statewide elected official, as someone who oversees elections in the state of Utah, um, I, I, I'm concerned about our election workers. And so one of the things that we are working on is how to get some um, resources, some mental health resources to our election officials throughout the state and kind of equip them with the tools that they need to, to mitigate some of that harassment and some of those things that come in, the, the meanness, the the, the, being able to go to church on Sunday with the neighbor who might have said some uh, mean accusations, you know, or just being able to uh, have a, a defense against that. Uh, it's probably a really healthy thing to do. Also to share with other people who might have had some experiences and know that they're not alone um, is something that is really important to, to my election office and to me personally. And I, hopefully, um, we can get some good resources, and I, I would love to collaborate um, on, on things like that uh, in a, at a future convening. Well, and I'll jump in too. Um, one of the things that, that became very apparent in, in the last four years is, is trying to find that sweet spot of how do you let the public know this is happening without encourage, encouraging more of it. And uh, there's a really great initiative that was started by the Brennan Center in R Street, and I'm blanking on the third. There's another. So are they. <laughs> Another wonderful organization that escapes me at the moment, uh, who brought together election officials and law enforcement officials, and this was uh, in the summer, I believe, of 2022, and it was a really powerful um, discussion. It's called the Committee on Safe and Secure Elections, and. As we sat in that room and started sharing what was happening, it was uh, very apparent that law enforcement had no idea what was happening with us, and we had no understanding of the law enforcement community, to be honest, because we ran elections and they figured elections happens once a year. Um, and so when, when we started asking things like, we're receiving threats, and you're not prosecuting these these death threats that my staff and I are, are receiving, and they're horrible. You know, someone said that, you know, I hope that you get assassinated. That, that should be something actionable. And law enforcement sat there and explained to us, the sheriffs and police chiefs in the room, actually it doesn't raise to the legal standard that we can act upon it. And that was really enlightening for the election officials in the room. And they explained the difference of saying, I hope someday that your family and you die in a very violent, awful way is protected by the First Amendment. But saying, I am going to hurt you and your family is an actionable, actionable you know, violation of the law. And so those conversations started and great things have come from it. One of them was uh, Neil Kelly from Orange County, California, former registrar, had been in law enforcement himself. And he said one of the things is law enforcement officials don't always know what the laws in their own state related to elections are. So if we had a pocket guide for my state and it had all of the citations, I would know on when I get a call from an election official that there's someone disrupting a polling place, what I can and can't enforce. And so the, the committee's been working on that and I think that we're up to about 30 plus states of doing these pocket guides and they're available and, and you can get that at the uh, website that I don't remember the address to. I'm just doing really good here. But it's things like that I think are, are what we're trying to do and, and uh, it's, it's real, it's been pervasive, it's it is, uh, it's part of the reason I think we've seen the exodus, and it's, uh, we're working through it. 
But, but you're right. Call, sorry, calling out yeah. political violence is actually really important. Um, not ever, right. ever sanctioning it even with silence. Okay, it's a low bar. <laughs> don't hurt people. Yeah. Don't intimidate people. I mean, the only reason I'm sitting here is because I lost my temper one time about that. No one would care who the hell I was if I hadn't done that on December 1st. But I mean, it's a low bar. Don't use violence. Don't threaten intimidation. And if somebody does it, they have to be held accountable. Right. Call them down. Call them out by name. Don't be nuanced. Don't be, I mean, just flat out do it. If it's on your team, even more so. If it's on the other team, you have to do it then too. But no, it's, I think every elections official who's around that, who has to deal with it, who has to see the outcomes. I've gone around this country and talked to county elections officials where Biden won by 30 points or Trump won by 30 points, and they are all on the edge of crying half the time. Yes. I've cried in front of Congress and on CBS Network News, so yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. So I, th I think, um, well, to your point, I mean, the, the one thing if you want to see continued exodus of election officials um, is to, to let this go un, uh, unchecked. Uh, because, you know, we're all, we've all got wives and children and husbands and so, you, you know, you make these decisions on, you know, at the end of the day, is it worth it? Um, not, not to overstate it, but and again, they're, they're, but you, you've seen, you know, I've got friends in other jurisdictions in other states that it's just unconscionable what's, what, what's happened to them. Um, and, and the, you know, the things that you don't, after the initial uh, headline in the newspaper, what they have to go through um, in the days and months and what changes in their daily life they have to make because of, of these things. Um, so, you know, I, I, as you said, it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly low bar. One of the challenges uh, that we have in elections is elections are expected to be fully accessible. That's the nature of elections. But there's, there's also an expectation that they're fully secure. And there's, there's, there's kind of a continuum there because, as I've told people, I, I can make the most secure voting system in the whole world. No one could use it. But I can make the most accessible voting system in the world and, you know, it would be very insecure. So you, there, there is some, some uh, sliding scale, if you will. It's, it's try to make elections as accessible as possible and trying to make our offices and our, and our polling places accessible, but also trying to make them secure. And sometimes you have embedded um, uh, challenges. For instance, um, in, at least in Florida, and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's like this in other parts of the, uh, particularly the Southeast, is, is there was policies that are, were, were put in place 50, 60 years ago to prevent law enforcement from being in polling places for obvious reasons. Now you, you sort of kind of looking at it from through a different lens and say, well, that, does that really make sense? Um, so it, it's, it, it's, it's a challenging environment. You know, when for us, we've got 80, 80 different polling places that you have to expect to be secure. And you, you know, can't have law enforcement there. You can't have weapons there. Um, so it, it's in, in, I appreciate you raising that because that, that is, that, that's, it is a challenge and it's something that's on the minds of uh, election officials um, across the board, uh, across the country. So. All right, on that light, happy note, we're going to end this panel. Uh, could you please give them a round of applause? For <laughs>